Bienvenue au Festival Metropolis Bleu 2021. Welcome to Blue Metropolis Festival for 2021. My name is Shelley Pomerantz. This event is titled Rest and Recuperate from Taiwan to Norway to Brampton, Ontario. And thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are broadcasting from Jojage, which is what the Gnungahaga call Montreal. This place has and continues to be a historical gathering place for many indigenous peoples. And we're grateful to be part of a long and proud history of creating and sharing stories on these lands. Part of Montreal or Jojage that I live in is made up of a network of lanes. Uh, once horse-drawn wagons delivered coal and ice and other goods through these lanes. And now deliveries, of course, are made by car and truck and occasionally even by bicycle. Um, over the last year during this pandemic, I've walked many, many of those lanes, sometimes alone, sometimes with a friend, sometimes almost always with my dog. These aren't necessarily beautiful lanes or particularly clean or green and leafy. But during the pandemic, I have to admit, they've offered a place for quiet, for contemplation, and retreat, even in the heart of the city. And they also tell another story about the city, one that you can't read if you're just walking along the streets. Today, I'm joined by three authors who have explored and written about certain sites, whether in nature or in towns and cities, as places of contemplation, places to reconnect with oneself, uh, to take a break from the frenetic pace of contemporary life. They are Jessica J. Lee, Torbjorn Ekelund, and Kirstine McLeod. And welcome to the three of you. Um, before we begin, I would like to give a little bit of your background and also to mention, uh, actually I should mention that your books, uh, for anybody listening, their books are available from paragraphbooks.com, which is easy to find online. Now to give uh, some of your background, uh, Jessica J. Lee was awarded the 2019 RBC Taylor Emerging Writer Award. Her first book, Turning a Year in the Water, chronicles her journey swimming 52 lakes in a single year. Her most recent book, Two Trees Make a Forest, won the Hillary Weston Writers' Trust Prize for nonfiction and was a 2021 Canada Reads uh, contender. She hails from London, Ontario, and now makes her home in London, England. Torbjörn Ekelund is the author of In Praise of Paths and editor of the Norwegian online nature publication, Harvest Magazine, which documents uh, wilderness adventures, environmental issues, and our relationship with nature. In all of his works, he explores and writes about the small things in nature that surround us every day. He lives in Oslo, Norway. Uh, next fall, he has another book coming out called A Year in the Woods, Small Journeys into Nature. Kirstine McLeod is a writer and yoga teacher. Her debut collection of short stories, The Animal Game, was published in 2016. Her fiction, poetry, and creative nonfiction have appeared in prominent literary journals, including The New Quarterly and The Malahat Review, and scores of her articles have been featured in leading Canadian magazines. She divides her time between Kingston, Ontario, and a riverside cabin in the woods near Bancroft. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Uh, Torbjorn, I'm going to turn to you first. Um, you live in Norway, but your book starts in Canada, in Newfoundland, in fact, um, on a very, very tiny path. Can you tell us about this minute path? Yeah, well, uh, when I started writing the book, I, I, I didn't know that I would uh, actually end up starting in Canada, uh, which is funny now. Uh, I, I started reading about paths and, and walking, and then um, suddenly I came over this uh, this uh, small site at the southeastern point, I think, of uh, Newfoundland. Uh, uh, that's how we pronounce it. Yeah, there are two ways: Newfoundland or Newfoundland. Newfoundland. I I normally say Newfoundland, so I I think it's easier. Yeah. Well, uh, on the southern point of uh, Newfoundland, there is a place called Mistaken Point. Uh, which is a, a very famous place for uh, for fossils. So, and they actually found there uh, the first documented proof of movement by will. So, there is a tiny creature that uh, 550 million years ago actually uh, was laying on a rock and decided to move from one place to the other, about 15 centimeters or something like that, I think. 
So uh, I found out that it was a very good place to start the book because uh, to make a path, you have to have a movement based on will. Somebody has to decide, I want to go from here to there. And then another one has to make the same decision uh, and so on and so on. And then finally, uh, you will have a path, a visible path. But so it's very, it's, it's very tiny that little path. Oh, it's very path. tiny, and probably made by some snail-like uh, creature, uh, which I, I have no idea how it uh, used to look. But it is um, uh, the first documented movement that is made by will uh, in in the history of uh, of uh, the Earth. Okay. Now, can you tell us about your? own first path because you have a, a personal path from your childhood can you tell us where that path is yeah it's a very small path uh, that runs behind my family's uh, cabin uh, which is uh, situated in a in a in a large wood uh, we used to walk it uh, all the time when i was a little boy and uh, when i wrote this book i uh, um, you know i started thinking about it was like um, I realized that there is a, um, a very uh, intimate relationship between paths and stories. So paths, uh, you've walked many times, especially the ones you walked when you was a child, um, are um, visible, the visible story of your life, really. So in the end of this book, uh, I uh, go back and walk the path uh, once more, I think it was more than 30 years since the last time. With, and it was a very exciting moment for me because I, you know, uh, I was really wondering uh, how does it really look after all these years? And is the actual path the same path as I remember? Uh, the answer I won't uh, tell no, you. No, I was going to say, but don't it's very, give it it's, <laughs> It was a very surprising experience for me. I'm sure. And, and, um, Paths, I mean, you kind of lost track of paths for many years in your life, but something happened to you to bring them back into your life. Can you describe what that was? Yeah, I. Uh, it's probably five years ago now. I suddenly uh, had a, a seizure, you know. Uh, suddenly everything turned black and I woke up in the hospital and it turned out that I had uh, uh, epilepsy. And the first thing uh, the doctors told me was that... Uh, you can no longer drive a car because Ooh. you lose your driver's license. Obviously, you can't risk having epileptics driving around on the highway. So uh, I thought, what in the world am I going to do now without my car? And it uh, probably took me three days to get used to not having a car and uh, to get used to actually walking everywhere I was. Uh, I had to go. So I started walking, and uh, ever since, I've only walked. It was uh, very strange because, uh, you know, the habit of driving seems to be uh, almost impossible to to um, change, but it turned out to be very easy. Hmm. So since then, I've been a, been a walker. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Jessica, you grew up in eastern Canada. Um, the natural world that you explore in this book, actually, I have, I should hold up everybody's covers here. Here's In Praise of Paths. And here's Two Trees Make a Forest, Jessica's book, and I'll hold up Kirstein's book when I talk to Kirstein in just a minute. Um, so in your book, in Two Trees Make a Forest, you're exploring Taiwan, which was a, an unfamiliar exotic place for you. Could you tell us a little bit about what drew you there and, and the contrast between the natural world that you know and the one you discovered there? Yeah, so I, my family, my mom grew up in Taiwan. She was born uh, and raised in Taiwan. My grandparents had emigrated there from China uh, in the 1940s. And so I always had a sense of, of Taiwan as being sort of this background home for my family in some sense, um, as being the place where I think so much of our heritage was in many ways. Um, and I, I hadn't really grown up with a strong sense of that connection. Like we didn't go back to visit often. And so for me, I was sort of doubly grappling with um, 
you know, not just wanting to get to know my family's story and uh, that sort of past, but also negotiating the fact that I was sort of belonging, but not belonging. Um, I'd, I'd grown up in Eastern Canada and mixed race. And so there were those sort of questions of how much of that that place was mine, was familiar, was was home in a way, um, even though I'd grown up elsewhere and had lived in many other places. Uh, so it was sort of this journey of of, I guess, re- recuperating a sense of connection and familiarity and, um, I guess, fluency with, with the landscape and with the place. And there's so much that goes on in this book. I mean, you're exploring your, your family history, you're, you're exploring nature, you're exploring the country's history, the history of Taiwan, and you're looking at yourself, what you're experiencing as all this is happening inside you. Um, but you, one thing that's also really interesting is you talk about how different um, in terms of the natural world or in terms of weather Taiwan is from what you knew growing up. I mean, you mentioned um, there are like, you know, there are earthquakes, there are volcanoes, there are landslides there all the time. I think you said there are 15,000 earthquakes a year in Taiwan. There are very, very, very many. And I, I had grown up um, I'd grown up in London, Ontario with, you know, my mom had always said to me, where I'm from, the weather is like this. We don't have this cold and we have earthquakes all the time. And she would tell me, you know, there was an earthquake every single day. And I thought that was hyperbole. But as it turns out, it's there's, you know, a few hundred every day, not big ones, but like small ones that they do register. Um, but yeah, I think it was, you know, for me, not so much dealing with a foreignness or an exoticism of the place, but this idea that... I guess I always had a question mark over my my belonging and my sense of familiarity with with Taiwan, um, and I wanted to be able to get rid of that question mark, perhaps by just spending enough time there that I, I I felt at least some obligation to the place, some some personal care. My that, that my own story was sort of written into the land, um, and yeah, the book naturally then tells many many scales of storytelling to do with the place, right, many many levels. I- Kirstine, let me show your book cover now here. <laughs> um, you describe um, in this book, In Praise of Retreat, you describe your former self as a real city person. I loved your description. <laughs> You're quoting a British author who, who talks about being antsy if you find yourself miles from a lemon. And I used to experience that when I would go to my cottage, it, the, that I was miles from a lemon and from garlic. That seemed to me so... <laughs> clear. Um, t- tell me a bit about what happened. You spent 20 years living and working in Toronto, and then suddenly you felt the need for something else. What happened to you? Well, it's funny because I didn't consciously feel the need. It seems when I look back to be such a serendipitous thing, but I don't know about your life, but oftentimes I unconsciously am responding to something. So things seem to happen serendipitously, but it's an inner call that hasn't become conscious yet. So I think this might have been the case. Um, I was living in downtown Toronto and I was working as a writer and um, a journalist. So it was lots of busy deadline driven environments. And I don't know, it just seemed like I couldn't get any peace and quiet. There were little kids living next door who didn't have enough to do. So they'd come and try and hang out with me because I was working at home. And one day I just put my arms out and I said, I just want me squared of peace. So that was the first step. And then the second one was some friends had a dream of buying a log cabin in the woods which I didn't have. I just didn't want to be anywhere where there were more biting insects than <laughs> than people. Uh, but we would go along just for the adventure to go with them um, on their search for this log cabin in the woods. So as part of that journey, uh, we realized we couldn't really afford a house in Toronto because it was so expensive, but we could afford a cabin in the woods. So in a fit of madness, we bought this little place that's a mile down a logging road. Um, you have to cross a creek to get there. There's no running water. There's no electricity, no nothing. So we bought this place and at first I remember being inside and the deer flies here in the summer are incredible they're just dreadful and I was inside and they were all against the screens and I thought what have I done this is not what I signed up for Um, but the thing that happens it's kind of like what Torgrim was saying like you have your habits but then once the habits drop away uh, 
things really change. And that's what happened to me over some time. So at first I felt like I wanted to tidy up sticks in the woods because it was too messy or we'd get there after the four hour drive from Toronto. And what we thought was um, just a rock swam away. It was a snapping turtle. And we've been there having a drink for about an hour. We didn't even notice it. So that was my urban self. Um, but then gradually I started to really like the peace and quiet. And uh, Dorothy Parker has a poem called Sanctuary. And she talks about leaving behind all her burning bridges. <laughs> So I, at first it was like that, but then I started to have new eyes. I started to learn more about the plants. I started to feel peace. Um, and once I settled and rested, that's when things got really interesting. So when an interchange happens, the next thing you know, your outer life has changed. And next thing you know, I'm leaving Toronto to move to Kingston. I'm changing my life up to do some things that had long been deferred, like um, changing my life so I could be a yoga teacher. And instead of doing journalism, doing more literary writing. So it really had transformed my life. Um, and that's what I see as retreat doing. It kind of creeps up on you. You don't realize what's going to happen. You get out of your habit patterns and then you discover this rich inner dimension at least in my case that I didn't know existed <laughs> um, but you actually say in the book that you don't like the word retreat do you have a better yeah. word? why don't you like the word retreat well, it's not actually the word retreat that I don't like. It's Western ideas about retreat. So often there's this connotation like Westerners tend to think that it's weakness or it's running away or it's escaping or things like that. You know, like um, I've even heard people say, I don't want to say I'm going on a retreat. Like I want to advance, not retreat. I'm not trying to hide from the world. It has all these kind of connotations. So in the book, I kind of look at other definitions of retreat. Retreat was the most serviceable word I could come up with without using uh, religious language. I feel like there's a gap in our language and our understanding here um, because, you know, words like sanctuary, which appears in the subtitle of my book, or words like sacred space or private space, there's lots of words, but none of them captured the broad um, phenomenon of retreat that I wanted to explore, which crosses vast territory of, you know, religious and spiritual and secular practices. Um, so retreat was what I settled on. But I also added that, um, you know, there's a the word temenos um, in Greek that means a, a sacred precinct that's set aside from everyday purposes and everyday life. So that's the way I think of a retreat. It's not about the social and active um, that takes up most of our everyday lives. It's more about the extraordinary and also the more solitary and reflective and receptive part of life. So retreat was the best one I could find, but I do go on at length about things I'd add <laughs> to that Western definition to broaden it quite a lot. Okay. Um, well, you've touched on something there, people's attitude about um about people when you're seeking a, a less frenetic existence, and I'm addressing all three of you here, when you're seeking serenity, people will say, oh, well, that's something that only pri the privileged among us can indulge in. You know, people who don't have to constantly worry about paying their bills or feeding their families. And I wonder if one of you wants to respond to that. How do, how do you respond to people who say, oh, it's just for, you know, the wealthy or the privileged? Jessica? So my sense of this is I actually really do agree with that criticism. Um, I, I think it's about scale. I think in, in, you know, in many situations, being able to find a connection with place, um, a connection with the natural world, with non-human nature, to be able to step outside of our lives in any capacity, obviously to be able to do so in a dramatic fashion. Like I, I went to Taiwan for a long period of time, which is a freedom that I had because A, I had funding. B, I had a passport that allowed me to travel, an identity that allowed me to travel. I had, you know, a, I had the freedom in my job and I, I didn't have, I don't have kids. And so it was really feasible. But I think, you know, the the question that I would sort of then, then sort of place in response is, can we find other scales at which to, to, to find a way in, to find an avenue in? And that might be, um, you know, the thing I was thinking about, because I, I live in quite a big city, is, you know, can I just notice little bits of moss on the bridge at the railway station when I'm waiting for the train? Can I just like find those tiny, tiny moments, um, which I know is a challenge in itself, but just to sort of sometimes change our expectations of what that might look like. Um, I, I think that's a good way in. Torbjorn? I do uh, agree 100%. And it's very interesting uh, what you mentioned, because uh, I think uh, exactly the same. Uh, 
interests me more and more all the you know the tiny and very available spaces of nature that surrounds uh, all of us uh, all the time i I recently saw a map uh, of Oslo where uh, I think it was the, uh, some uh, governmental institution that had actually um, uh, colored all the green spaces, not only the parks, but all the green spaces in the city. Uh, Treetops and, you know, just some tiny grass things along the sidewalks and stuff. And it was amazing to see how much green it actually was. Uh, the parks was only a very small part of all the green. So I really like that idea of, uh, of uh, observing nature, uh, the, the, the small spaces of nature uh, that surrounds us all. And uh, I can only speak for Norway, but, but uh, historically, um, what we call friluftsliv, which is you know, like life in the open air, has been uh, been a thing for the for the the wealthy people or at least the upper classes. So in Norway in the 1800s, Englishmen came uh, and they started fishing salmon in the rivers and climbing the high mountains, which nobody had ever thought of of doing. You know, they had no because time. To most do of it. these people, pheasants and uh, lumberjacks and stuff, they spend their whole lives in nature. That's uh, it was a workplace, not a place for recreation. So I really agree, and I find it very interesting to to kind of investigate those those uh, small um, spaces of nature. Yeah, and the way I look at it is retreating is kind of a state of mind and heart, ultimately. So it's kind of like learning to drive. If you're on a busy, you know, if you want to learn how to drive, you go on a small road. And then eventually, when you get good at it, you go back onto the bigger road and try to drive. And it's kind of like that with taking a step back into a private space. Um, you know, it really helps if you can go for three days or a month or something to a physical place, remove yourself from your habits. And then when you get back into your everyday life, it makes it easier to connect to those um, spaces within your everyday life. Um, but if you really can't do that, um, there's always nature. You know, Lemoyne Point is a beautiful lakeside park here in Kingston and the number of people that have been going there ever since the pandemic started for instance so there's if you just look to the edges I think there are all, almost for everybody there are spaces that you can find where you can enter that state of mind and heart that's a more peaceful reflective and solitary place um, and it's it's, you know, I'm thinking about the Spanish um, architect and he found a place under a bridge and he built a secret studio underneath this thing. And he winches himself over from one end of a viaduct over to the other. And he won't tell anybody where it is for obvious reasons, but he was going to enjoy it for as long as it lasted. So I think if you can learn to look to the edges, you can always find a space for reflection and, and a little bit of solitude. Is, is everybody meant for for retreat for solitude or some of us just not capable of it well it's funny there's so many misconceptions i found as i went through this book about what retreat is and what it means um but um you know people have said to me i don't think i could do that i'd unravel or <laughs> you know so some people love it and other people there's a lot of fear and loathing involved um but people who do serious retreats train for it, like it was the Olympics or something. So you might go on a short retreat just to rest and recuperate. But if you're a serious retreater, like a, a hermit or something who might be retreating on your own for an extended period of time, um, you'd have to be in a monastic life for quite a long time first as training. And then you would have to be allowed to become a hermit. So, you know, things happen. It's almost like a change of altitude. So when you start to spend time alone, if you're not used to it or, or in a community of other like-minded people, um, it can be like, you know, a change of altitude. It can be a bit difficult at first. You might get bored or you might get fearful or all kinds of things might happen. But if you can wait for long enough, um, long enough for that to settle, um, then it becomes more possible. So I think it's a bit of an immersion or you have to be patient to change altitude and it is something you can prepare for. Um, that said, you know, if you show people a Rembrandt painting, right, some people are going to love it right away. Some people are going to like it once they've had a bit of introduction and maybe education. And there's always going to be some people who are just going to see nothing in it and hate it. <laughs> so I think it's a similar thing with retreat. <laughs> this is sort of not the same thing, but related um, about walking, Torbjorn, in your book, you write about people who walk very long distances. 
and I'm quoting you here, all of them say the same thing about it. You enter into this inner state that you've never been in before and from which after a while you never wish to emerge. Your relationship yeah. to the path becomes so intense and emotional that it is eventually difficult to imagine a full and valuable life anywhere other than on the trail and doing anything other than walking. And I, I wanted to ask you and Jessica as well, um, because Jessica, you've obviously done a fair bit of walking, not to mention swimming. Um, what does walking, particularly in nature, actually do to the brain? Good question. Yeah, I've spoken to a lot of people that I've never walked uh, one of those long distance trails, and I don't think I ever will. But I've spoken to a lot of them. And they say all they all say the same thing. Um, they in a way they get they get addicted to walking, but in a very positive way. Uh, and I think it has my guess is that it has to do with um, uh, it feels meaningful in a in a very in a way that they're really not used to to feeling so um, they probably realize that they are in a way made for walking that it's we we used to be nomads uh, one many many thousand years ago or not that really but 10,000 years ago we were we were nomads 5,000 years ago we uh, we found, we started settling so it's it's really a very short period in in the history of man that we actually stay in the same place uh, over a longer period of time so i think uh, at least for me it's um it's difficult for me to to explain in english but it has to do with i'm not really i don't know that much about what happens uh, when it comes to the chemical stuff in the brain when you walk but it's uh, for me, it's some sort of connection between walking and thinking. And I ha I think it has to do uh, with uh, speed. With When you walk, you adapt, in a way, your speed so that it corresponds with the, with the speed of your thinking or with the slowness of your thinking. So I, I, I really... And you have to walk quite a while before you really, you know, notice it. Uh, that... Uh, in a strange way, it's like uh, your feet and your brain uh, pick up the same pace, and that that that's when it starts to get really, really wonderful. And I think that's what the long distance trail walkers are referring to when they okay. talk about this. Uh, that they really, you know, get dependent uh, upon the life uh, on the trail. I have, for some reason, I think it was Nancy Sinatra who sang the song, These Boots Are way, Made for Walking. Yeah. I suddenly have that going through my She's head. She's right. Nancy Sinatra <laughs> knew, knew how it was. Except that I think you <laughs> like to walk barefoot, if I read you correctly. I, in the summer, uh, which is uh, not that uh, long uh, here in Norway, I, uh, I walk barefoot most of the time. Yeah, I do which may seem a bit eccentric and my children don't really like it at least uh, <laughs> not if i'm in a you know in the city and in in the supermarket and stuff like that but it feels really i don't know it feels natural and that's one thing but the most um uh significant thing is that it feels very unnatural to put on shoes again mm. especially socks it feels uh, horrible terrible I, I know that I've, eventually I have to do it because it gets very cold. But but I don't I don't like it at all. So now in the in the in the middle of April I've um, thrown them away the socks, uh, even though it's still pretty cold. <laughs> Jessica, do you have something you want to say about walking there? Yeah, I think you know for me I'm struck by you know I guess long term repetition of of any sort of physical activity I think. It, it sort of has that that impact. Um, and, you know, when you mentioned sort of walking becoming addictive, I was thinking of, I, I'm a cold water swimmer. I swim through winter. And that for me is like, that's, a, that's addictive. <laughs> um, and it, you know, just what that does to the brain to sort of get out and do that repeatedly. Um, you get quite hooked to the endorphins, I think. And and for me, at least when I, you know, this is actually thinking back to my, my previous book, um, where I was, I was going out every week and swimming in a new lake and I was getting there usually by cycling or by hiking. 
um, there was for me, at least in that process, because it was for a full year, though I hadn't left my everyday life, I was still living my life, but I had that one day every week where I, I had that space. And when it finished, I, I genuinely didn't really know what to do with myself in a way, uh, because there was a real sense of purpose in it. There was a real sense of routine. And I, I think for my brain, for my heart, it was just a really good thing. Um, and so people say, well, what did you do afterwards? And I said, I, I just kept going. <laughs> I just kept going to the lakes. I stopped <laughs> counting for the book, but I just kept going because I didn't actually want to stop. Um. I'm I'm curious about what's happening, what you see as as uh, our, our lives are becoming increasingly digitalized and or digitized and overtaken by technology. Uh, do you think that retreat and contemplation and and doing things like walking long distances are they becoming more essential? Uh, I think so. Uh, I think many people have experienced it now during the the, the past year's pandemic. Uh, that uh, at least for me, walking is not it's not a big thing. It's like uh, it's just a small habit that suits even this uh, strange um, lockdown life. So I think that uh, I write a lot about uh, that uh, you need to you need just to sort of make it a habit and then don't really do make a big thing about it but just walk just just uh, keep walking and uh, when you keep walking you keep seeing you keep observing the things around you so uh, a couple of weeks ago i walked uh, uh, through oslo and i saw above my head i saw th- some starlings you know the bird mm-hmm. and they came because I write a book about birds now, so I, you know, it's like I walk and then I see the birds, so it adds up in a way. But then I saw the behavior of these starlings with a bit, they looked scared. And then uh, everybody else looked down in the pavement, uh, walking back and forth. But then I knew that something is going to happen in three seconds. And then came a peregrine falcon over the rooftops and <laughs> grabbed one of the starlings. So it's like amazing things happen all around but you, we don't see it and my my uh, main point i guess in my book is that uh it, the speed of our lives is is the the basic reason why we don't see it because it happens all over the place all the time so walking is the best <laughs> the best way to to increase or to to better one's ability to see and it doesn't really matter where you are. If you if you're not able to 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 notice the details, uh, you, it doesn't matter if you're in, you know on the on the top of Mount Everest or on the Great Barrier Reef or in the Sahara Desert. You need to you need to see. Um, and that's why I also uh, very convinced that to see you need to walk. See, I, I think this is really interesting because this question of, you know, the world becoming, our lives becoming much more digitized and much more caught up with technology. For me, I, I don't see that as deeply in opposition to getting out into nature or noticing the natural world. I actually, I think we've never lived in a better moment for having that knowledge be really accessible to so many people, whether it's through apps that will teach you about plants or, you know, like the night sky app that will teach you about stars. And I think this is, you know, I feel like so much of my work has been about undoing so much of our sense of like, when people imagine a nature writer, they usually imagine a man, (laughs) they usually imagine, you know, the paper map and the pair of binoculars. Mm -hmm. And I really like to be very explicit about the fact that when I go hiking up a mountain, usually my map is on my iPhone. And when I take notes out in the field, I'm taking them in my notes app or in the voiceover, uh, like the voice memo app in my phone. And that this doesn't stop me from getting out into the world and really being there. It's just a tool. It's, you know, it, it's about where I where I place my attention. Um, and increasingly, you know, a lot of my other friends who, who do similar work to me, who are also sort of nature writers, so to speak, we talk about it really often that, you know, so much of actually what we do is facilitated by the internet, by being able to, you know, check out a trail by satellite imagery before you go walk it. Um, or, you know, just to have those small bits of access. And I think that has really, in some sense, democratized, um, mm. I think, that, that sort of knowledge and 
and the opaqueness of, of what I think for many people would have been sort of, oh, nature knowledge, I, I, I don't know where to start. I think there's a real opening up in, in that. Um, so I, I'm kind of pro-technology on this front. <laughs> Christine, do you want to add something here? Yeah, um, that's really interesting what you were just saying, Jessica. I sometimes wonder if it's a generational thing, because I lived almost exactly half my life analog and half of it digital. And since it became digital, I have found that I feel like it's an, almost like an invasion of my cognitive headspace. And I need to really remove myself from technology in order to kind of clear that out again and let everything settle. So I think it might be, you know, the, the whole idea of the fluency of it. I'm really interested to hear what you said, because I have been wondering if it for younger people, perhaps there is a bit more facility with that, you know, having an app, uh, a friend of mine has an app and she can take a picture of a flower and then she knows what it is. She learns all kinds of things that way. Um, so for me, and also because I'm a yoga teacher, I think I have this view that um, we're getting more and more disembodied. And in my book of retreat, the type of retreat that's the most popular is pilgrimage. Um, that was before the pandemic even happened. Um, and yoga and meditation retreats are, are quite popular as well. So it's the really embodied things that we seem to need. And um, retreats have always been in nature. So the first places humans retreated to millennia ago were sacred waterfalls or rivers or you know the inner mountain <laughs> was the other place they went um so i think nature's always been really important but in times that i think are we're a bit disembodied and almost unearthly uh I think it's even more important than ever. And during the pandemic, I've really noticed a lot of essays, like a lot of new people. I've met a whole bunch of new friends. I walk every morning in the park. My friend and I walk the dog uh, in this beautiful lakeside park. And um, I've met a whole new set of friends. People I've never seen there in years are there every morning as well. And so I know that people are really relying on the solace of the natural world um, to get through some difficult times. I'd like to know from you, Jessica, from you, Torbjorn, if you're seeing a change also around you because of the pandemic in our relationship to, to nature. It's become really a hot topic. I will say that much. Um, I feel like around, uh, you know, every I, I was in Berlin for the first half of the pandemic. I've been in London for the second half. And in both places, it's been all about parks. It's been all about nature and noticing your neighborhood. Everyone's been getting outdoors a lot more. Um, it, it's largely been the only place that people could socialize. Um, and so I feel like that's been something I've seen across the board. And, and even in my own work, you know, I, I edit a magazine as well. And um, last year, almost every submission that we received, and we're talking hundreds of submissions, were about uh, usually gardening or walking in the park or reconnecting with nature in the pandemic. It was, it was across the board the thing everyone wanted to write about. Um, which I think is really exciting. I just really hope that that energy carries on. Uh, I think for those of us who, you know, we spend our, our daily working lives in a way noticing nature. Um, I really hope that, I hope that people can continue it when they when they do end up having to go back to work or when they're as busy um, or when things go back to, you know, the way they were, when we can be indoors socializing again. <laughs> in Oslo, Torbjorn, are you seeing a change in people's relationship to the natural world? Oh, definitely. Uh, definitely, probably much the same as in London and uh, all over the place. Uh, that was, I think that was probably the first thought people had when, when they realized that uh, the society is going to lock down. Uh, we can't do the, the things we normally do. So I think they just thought, let's go for a walk. <laughs> uh, let's just go for a walk and see what happens. Let's take our uh, shoes so off. I, let's I, take our shoes off and go for a walk. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's go for a walk. So I see, you know, in the gardens, people have uh, have uh, uh, fires and uh, all those uh, kind of things, uh, and it probably says something uh, very fundamental about uh, how we uh, how we respond to a crisis. We need to seek meaning probably somewhere, and and uh, it feels natural to 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 go out in nature to do it or uh, at least then in as i uh, talked about um in the, the the tiny natural spaces that surrounds uh, all of us also the ones who live in the big cities i read about in central park there was an owl uh three four five months ago i think they called him barry the owl something like that and the new york times wrote about it they were like Lots of people 
uh, walking uh, in Central Park to see an owl. And I read about it and I thought, this, is, uh, this means something. The New Yorkers <laughs> now spend their time looking at one particular owl that's sitting on a branch all day. There is some kind of truth hidden there. <laughs> I'd like to ask you um, a few uh, questions about a few specific things in your books. Uh, Torbjörn, t- tell us a little bit about Emma Gatewood. Yeah, Emma Gatewood. Uh, well, I write about some... Um, there There are a lot of famous characters in the history of walking. Uh, most of them have been, like, like you said, uh, people belonging to the upper classes. Uh, uh, but this woman, uh, Emma Gatewood, Grandma Gatewood, as she, uh, she was called after a while, she lived in, uh, she walked from the Appalachian Trail, a very famous long distance trail. It used to be the longest. Uh, I don't think it's that anymore, but still, it's very long, 3,500 kilometers. It's the, it's the Canadian Trail that's taken over now, right? The Great Trail? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Canadian Trail has taken over. That's right. I think I, I write it in my book as well. But, but at this particular time, the Appalachian Trail was the longest. Uh, and uh, she was married to a man that uh, was not that very nice to her. And she had children. So she waited until the children uh, were old enough. So they moved out. And then she decided to walk uh, from uh, Georgia to Maine, I think the Appalachian Trail starts in Georgia and then ends in Maine. Sorry? How old was she when she did She was uh, 67, I think, when she started walking and she had nothing. You know, like, that's also something I write about in the book, that people people nowadays have all this fancy equipment. And I see people going into the forests outside Oslo and it looks like they're going on some kind of polar expedition but they are actually just going for a walk Uh, but she had nothing she had some food in a little uh, bag uh, on her shoulder and and she started walking no and I think when she was like sorry no sleeping bag no no sleeping bag nothing like that she I think she knocked on if the weather was bad she knocked on doors and and you know got to sleep at in in people's houses on her way and uh, when she was almost in uh, Maine, uh, the newspapers started writing about her. So she became very popular. And I think uh, people also started to walk beside her. Like, you know, like in Forrest Gump, the people uh, starts running with him uh, in a way that he, he ends up like some kind of guru. So she walked till the end of the uh, end of the trail in Maine. And when she got there, she went back home and and decided to walk uh, walk it and, uh, one more time. So she actually walked 7,000 kilometers uh, from the age of 67, which is pretty She walked it twice. Impressive. She but, walked, yeah, she it, walked twice. it twice. So um, talking about being, uh, you know, finding, finding oneself in the, in, the, in the act of walking, she was probably very high on that list. She found out that this is a very nice thing to do, so let's just walk it again she was a pro (laughs) she was a pro or she ended up being a pro (laughs) jessica do you have some uh, model for you in in the kind of exploration that you do is there somebody you admire out there oh i mean i i don't know if there's anyone in particular i i grew up reading a lot of sort of environmental writing and you know reading reading works by by rachel carson and um british nature writers um you know, I, I was sort of educated reading the likes of Richard Maybe, who, who I really admire in, in some sense. Um, but I think for me, so much of my work has been about realizing that there haven't always been great models or examples, I think, for particularly people of color, people from migration backgrounds, um, people for whom, you know, getting into nature is not uh, always transparent, who don't grow up. Uh, in that kind of environment uh, where that's sort of introduced to them easily. And so my work has really been about creating that for myself in a way. Um, you know, I probably think I've, I've learned more from fiction <laughs> than, than other things. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's always been a more complicated question for me, but one that I feel like is starting to really change because we're seeing such an amazing new generation of 
of, of authors and conservationists, etc., from much more diverse backgrounds getting out into the natural world, which I, I'm really, really hoping will have like a strong positive knock-on effect for the next generation. Mm. Um, Kirsten, you write about um, a number of hermits in your book. Do you have a favorite <laughs> hermit? Um, yeah, I have a few. It's really hard to choose, but maybe I'll tell you a couple of them and I'll just speak about one of them if that's okay, because I can't choose. So the my favorite hermit from the beginning is Lao Tzu. So he is supposedly, they don't know much about him, but he supposedly wrote um, the Tao Te Ching. And there's a wonderful translation by Stephen Mitchell that I really love. So I find myself really uh, in deep sympathy with these ancient philosophers of antiquity. Um, they were very much about the receptive uh, part of life. They talked about water as a metaphor for that. Um, so water, can, you know, takes the line of least resistance, but it can also erode stone. So it talks about the power of that receptive state. Um, uh, then Thoreau and Emily Dickinson are my next ones. So people don't usually count uh, Emily Dickinson as a hermit. And actually Thoreau himself said he wasn't a hermit, but they're hermits of sorts, right? They're retreating and exploring. Um, people talked about Emily Dickinson as a recluse, and I don't actually think she was. I think it was a strategy um, for a woman to have the agency to, to be a creative person. <laughs> I think in those days, you were expected to get married and have callers all day long. So yeah, anyway. Uh, but that's my actually, take on you her. also talk about um, yeah. uh, retreat as a, a feminist statement. So I guess yes, you know, and that brings me to my favorite hermit, who actually Jessica, maybe you'll know her, um, Sarah Maitland, who's from Scotland. She's a great hermit. She's a feminist. She's just an unbelievably interesting person, and she's like the patron saint of my book. So I had um, thought that I was going to write a book about my cabin in the woods and how it transformed my life. But then when I started reading her book called The Book of Silence, that's all about her. Uh, hermit uh, interlude, well, not interlude, it's continued. She fell in love with silence and she decided to explore it. And um, it's really just not something that society really likes a woman to do in particular. So she's a wonderful character. She complains about how if you announced you were going to sail around the world by yourself for two years, everybody would think it was fantastic. But if you say to them, you're going to be silent living on your own for two years, everyone thinks you've gone insane, which is kind of what happened to her. And she does very eccentric uh, experiments, kind of like yours, Torbjörn, um, walking in bare feet and doing things that your kids don't like. She decides to go for 40 days and 40 nights because she thinks it's an ironic and doable amount of time and she goes to a, a little cottage in the Isle of Sky to experience silence and she has hallucinations like all kinds of things happen so when I read her book I thought I don't want to just write about my cabin I want to write about these interesting rebels <laughs> that have existed since the beginning of time up to now like Sarah Maitland and it could have been another whole book to write about women and agency and retreat and maybe there'll be another book but she's just such a character I mean she wrote for uh, screen place for Stanley Kubrick. She was married to an Anglican priest at one point. Bill Clinton was a friend of hers um, at Oxford. Um, and now she lives in this tiny cabin, uh, not a cabin, a shepherd's cottage in a big empty moor. And that's her idea of paradise. So, you know, she's a really wonderful hermit. So she was a big inspiration. And I really love her writing and just her renegade spirit. She's really unbelievable. I, I feel obligated to ask you about somebody else that you write about in your book, uh, <laughs> Leonard Cohn, who who spent several years as a hermit, really, in a monastic retreat, correct? Right? That's right, yeah. And actually, he's really interesting to me. I decided I wanted to have one exemplar of retreat, and he seemed like a modern exemplar of retreat because uh, retreat has always been for uh, spirit, nature, and art and imagination, and he used retreat as a method for all of these things. So his formative retreat was in Hydra in Greece, and he had this beautiful old house that he bought with $1,500 that his grandmother had given him an inheritance or something. And um, he had a white room with almost nothing in it, and this was kind of his formative space for creation. So, you know, the AGNC was glimmering just out the window, and he had an old Olivetta Olivetti uh, typewriter that he bought in London for 40 pounds or something. And I think he wrote 
two or three novels, Bird on a Wire, a book or two of poetry. It was a really fantastic space for him. So after that, even though he was in the spotlight, he would always retire to hotel rooms. And there's all kinds of things about him in hotel rooms. There's the famous song about the Chelsea Hotel. So he loved empty, uncluttered spaces forevermore. And then he did a different kind of retreat. So he said that he needed, he felt a need for self-reform. So he went up Mount Baldy and went to one of the most uh, rigorous Zen retreats uh, that exist. So, you know, for humble monks, these guys uh, weren't very humble. They thought of themselves as the military, you know, the kind of SWAT team of the, <laughs> of the Zen monks because they were so rigorous. And he spent a really long time there in retreat, um, you know, uh, as a, and he became a Zen monk, he said, not because he was giving up his Judaism, but because it was part of the uniform. If he wanted to study with his teacher, he actually had to take his vows so again, a small hut on the mountain with next to nothing, uh, no possessions. Um, and then he came down the mountain. He went to India, another retreat. His lifelong depression lifted, and he said that he felt liberated. And then he worked in what he called his Tower of Song. And his son would say that with a monastic discipline, like every day he would go to work uh, writing music and writing poetry um, until he died. And it actually bought him some time on earth, they said, because he was working on a project he was trying to finish. So I don't know, Leonard Cohen seems to me to be somebody who's really integrated some of the contradictions of a worldly life and uh, and an inner life. Um, and he gave that sacred precinct um, high importance uh, in his life. And it was something that really sustained him. And um, he started an order of chivalry um, with its own little symbol that he would give out. And he said that, you know, there was no membership dues or anything. It was all about it, having a united heart and just gathering around a decent intention. So it was very interesting. Um, it really led him to connect the dots in his life to have both inner and outer um, coming together in that sacred space where he did his work and what he found most important to him. So retreat is um, really about what you care about most in life. And that's what he did in that space. So I thought he was a really good example to kind of show where it can lead. Uh, so we, should, it. we should perhaps mention that while he was in retreat, his agent um, embezzled <laughs> millions of his dollars. So, you know, while you're busy being in retreat, maybe when you need to keep an eye on some practical matters at the same time. Yeah, that's right. You deal with your spiritual life and then you come out and your finances are a complete disaster. But maybe that's why he was so graceful and went on that tour. And he never said a word of bitterness, you know, in the interviews, if you listen to them, never a word of bitterness about what happened and just went and took care of it. So I don't know. I think that, you know, that um, we're the center of a circle. So he'd sorted some things out for himself that then, you know, made his everyday life different. No, it's true that he was grateful in some way because he had to restart his career and it worked out well. Um, Jessica, you mentioned, you touched on this uh, a little bit about um, authors, you know, this sort of resurgence of authors and uh, nature writing. Um, we're seeing more and more people of color and more and more women, and, and it's not just men in those tilly hats anymore. Um and many, many authors over millennia have written about, well, maybe not millennia, but for a long time have written about retreat and about walking in nature and about contemplation, but also about the role it plays in their, their uh, creative process. Um, and I'm wondering if there are particular authors and books that have inspired um, the, the three of you, each of you. Jessica, if you want to talk, is there somebody yeah. specific that you think of? I think, you know, I, I read very broadly and I read I read quite a lot of poetry, which has always been a, a really fantastic guide. But um, particularly when I was working on, on this book, on, on Two Trees Make a Forest, um, what was really illuminating for me um, was delving into the uh, three, three decade, 30 year old, 40 year old tradition of Taiwanese nature writing, which um, is very, very much for the most part untranslated. Very few pieces have been translated into English. Um, and I was not super familiar with this field. And, you know, I, I had heard of a few authors, but I had a really fantastic experience. Um, I, I went to the Taiwan National Museum for Literature. And, you know, at this stage, I was working on the book and I was myself a nature writer. And I walked in and the banner in front of me just said, Taiwanese nature writing, an exhibit. And I thought, this has to be a joke. You know, I, I it, and it, was, it was such a fortuitous moment for me because I was able to sort of spend some time in this exhibit get to know this tradition that 
was really grounded in the place that I was not only writing about, but but that I'm, you know, by heritage connected to. Um, and so I sort of searched for everything I could find in translation and even tried to read a few things in Chinese. My my Chinese is not, my literacy is not brilliant. Um, and so I was reading a lot of uh, work by Wu Ming Yi, who is a Taiwanese nature writer um, and novelist. And he has two novels that I, I found really, really moving as I was reading. Um, one is called uh, The Man with the Compound Eyes. Oh, yes, and, I've heard of that book. Yeah, and the second one, The Stolen Bicycle, it was um, long listed for the International Booker some years back. Um, but I, I, I just, I really loved this idea of reimagining what a tradition of environmental writing, nature writing could look like, because it wasn't this same sort of man goes out into nature kind of thing that I think we're so familiar with in sort of Anglo, Anglo culture and Anglo-American culture in particular. Um, it was much more bound up with this idea of identity and belonging being very, very linked to uh, to working the land, to indigeneity in Taiwan in particular, which is its colonized land. Um, and, and, and for me, that was, I think, a really great sort of opening out to remind myself that there was more than the tradition that I was educated with in, in Canada and in Britain, um, and that I could really learn from that. Yeah. Mm. Torbjorn. Is there uh, somebody ooh, in the I've tradition? Read, sorry? Is there somebody in the tradition of of um, people writing about walking, about walking in nature that inspires well, you? Yeah, there, there are many books. I've read many books about walking, but I would um, f uh, I will uh, pick a book that is not about walking, but is uh, the most fascinating nature book I've ever read. And it's it's a book written by an English uh, author called J.A. Baker. I think it was published in 1965, 66. Uh, it's called The Peregrine, so the, the falcon. It's about two, fal uh, two falcons. Uh, he observes uh, them during a uh, winter uh, in, I think, Chelmsford, just uh, an hour's train ride outside London. And he writes about a book. It's a very strange book. It, it's, it's almost fiction, but it's not... <laughs> But uh, for me, that book is like, um, how, how shall I say it? It's 100% um, uh, subjective. So he writes about the nature he sees, the falcons he sees. Uh, so everything is very, very subjective. And he was criticized afterwards uh, by ornithologists for not being actually scientifically correct. And then there was another... Uh, another um, uh, guy in in um, a literary magazine in England who said this book should be forbidden to forbidden to read by ornithologists because <laughs> it it doesn't have anything to do about science it's something else and for me that's very inspiring because what he does is that he goes out in nature and afterwards he writes not about nature in itself but about what he actually experienced. So nature as it revealed itself for him at that particular time. So I will uh, really recommend this book. It's very famous in England especially, but still I don't think many people have heard of it. The Peregrine, J.A. Baker. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Mm, thank so you. I tried to write like him, but I probably... <laughs> I'll never manage, but but still I. I'll you can keep try. trying. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't. We don't have much time left, but I don't. I wanted to ask you about the role of, of contemplation and retreat in your own creative process. It seems like it's, kind of, one one all one thing, isn't it? Well, for me, it's definitely um, one thing which has to do with the walking and the thinking part, you know. It's like the sentences or, and the ideas very often come when, I, when I'm out in nature. When and I'm how walking. do you write them down then? Well, I always write them down because otherwise, I, you know, I forget them. Okay. I, for, I, I don't know, probably the same for you guys, that how many times I've had an idea just before <laughs> I fall asleep, for instance, and I think, okay, I'll write it down tomorrow, and the day after, it's mm -hmm. totally gone. And absolutely, yeah. it's like you can feel it uh, inside your brain that it's no, you don't, you don't even have to mm -hmm. try looking for it because it's, it's <laughs> gone forever. Christine, you have something you want to say there about 
how one writes and how mm -hmm. retreat and writing are interconnected? Yeah, well, for a long time, um, my work was not my vocation. So I feel like I found my way there. And part of the way I did that was by retreating so that I could focus on some of the, you know, keep these inner flames alive of things I wanted to be doing. So I did journalism school just because I thought I have to make a living and there was no such thing as a creative writing course in those days. So that's what I did, but it felt immediate, almost immediately like the wrong thing. So you know, the retreating has helped me to create that meditative space to do that work. And now it is integrated. So for me, I feel like, you know, um, I just love the idea of retreating or taking a step back from society and my everyday things that I'm doing. Because um, as opposed to emptiness or the void, the way we tend to think of it in the West, in the East, they think of it as the realm of possibility and potential. And that's what I feel like. That's my dream space that I enter. And I love the receptivity of that. I find it stimulating and exciting not to know what's going to happen. And that's where all my good ideas come from. And it's unfortunate because when you're in yoga, you know, you're not, you're meant to be focusing on your body and your breath, but I got to admit that there are times where I have a notebook to write down those things before <laughs> those quick silver things go missing <laughs> because I do find that, um, you know, entering that dream space or that body centered space where I have no expectations that something's going to happen is a real wellspring for me. And Jessica, last word to you. Yeah, I, I so for me, because, you know, I very often write about going on sort of long journeys. Um, but when I am doing the writing, I'm usually back in my daily life. I'm back in my everyday sort of process and, you know, husband and dog and all the things that are going on. And so for me, it's about finding those small moments to replicate that, that sort of feeling of retreat and possibility and creativity. So I usually pick one song that I will write a whole book to and I will play it on repeat, put my headphones on, sit in the coffee shop and find that sort of meditative moment in that space. And, and that for me is the sort of moment of creative possibility and walking the dog also, <laughs> taking the dog out of the park. <laughs> but, yeah. I hope you find something more inspiring than Nancy Sinatra's These Boots Are Red. <laughs> it could be the next one. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the three of you. It's been really wonderful meeting you, uh, e-meeting you, uh, Jessica J. Lee, uh, Torbjörn Eklund, and Kirstine McLeod. Jessica's latest book is, I should show it up here, is Two Trees Make a Forest. Torbjörn Eklund's latest is In Praise of Paths, and Kirsten McLeod's most recent title coming right now is In Praise of Retreat. Uh, all of these books may be purchased at paragraphbooks.com. And uh, thank you to our audience for joining us for this Blue Metropolis International Literary Festival event. To check out our other events, you can go to bluemetropolis.org backslash festival 2021. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, you very for much. the conversation, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.